All right, here we go. I feel like we should have a drum roll or some sound. Oh, this sermon, you guys get to hear me talk the whole time <laughs> at the beginning. All right. Next time I do this, I'm going to add a, a sound effect to that spinning wheel. <laughs> All right. Life is not set in stone. So I start this reflection without knowing what has come before and what will come after. I know that many might not realize, but I always leave the sermon writing as the last task when preparing a worship service. That way I can pull in all of the other pieces and tie them into one service for you all. It often helps me to create a pathway leading towards where I believe the congregation needs to go, a conversation that needs to happen or being introduced to a different way of seeing the world, tying our religious values to commonplace everyday events and ideas. The words of our hymns often find their way into my sermon and usually much more obviously the words of our centering piece is referred to as well. Though this may seem like the reiteration of words that might or might not mean very much to those listening, my intention with this practice is to spotlight the interdependence of our world. There are threads everywhere, weaving us all together. And so whether you have heard these words already, because the sermon is near the end of our hour together, or if they have not yet been spoken, I believe that it will all come together in the end in a way that only coloring outside of the lines can create a previously unseen image. Life is not set in stone. We always have the opportunity to seek out different paths, to choose a new route to take. We need not stay in the same lane as we tra traverse the world. So often as we set down a pathway, a choice made, a decision followed, we end up digging in our heels and choosing not to change route midway through. I've been through so many of these reroutes that sometimes I feel dizzy by my own life. And perhaps this is the life of a youngish adult and things settle out a bit more as I manage to find stability in my career and home life. But I'd be willing to bet that everyone in this room has experienced the need to change directions at least once in the past year. I was married at the age of 21. I had been seeing Richard for two years when he proposed to me and then a year and a half of engagement. At some point along the that timeline, I knew that I wasn't happy in this relationship. I knew that things needed to change between us or in him or in me in order for there to be a healthy relationship. But I continued to travel down the path that I was on, getting married young to my high school sweetheart. Well, I was in high school when we met. And we even talked about starting a family. Somewhere in the pit of myself, I knew that I was not happy with the decisions that I was making. I wasn't happy with the way our relationship was manifesting, and I wasn't happy with the person I had turned into. It took another 18 months of marriage for all of this unhappiness to become too heavy to carry, and the pain of changing became more acceptable than the pain of staying the same. 18 months after saying I do, I left my husband because I needed to change the path that I was traveling and I needed to rewrite my story. One that I had thought for a long time had been written into stone. Although it took me several months to come to terms with the fact that I was doing the right thing, that I was able to let go of the shame and hatred that I had had for myself in becoming a statistic, that I had joined the 50% of marriages that end. I was able to find freedom within that change within the change of that path as well. I was able to let myself go, to spend time seeking joy and fulfillment outside of my partner. I was able to play in my life again. 
Sometimes verging from the path that we are on can lead to a state of enchantment, a liminal place that can be made sacred with our decisions. Getting out of the groove that we have etched into stone can give us freedom that we never knew we needed. Allowing ourselves the opportunity to spin a wheel and realign to whatever, wherever it lands gives us the opportunity to laugh together, to be released from the patterns that hold us tight in our rituals, to find freedom in our ability to worship, to find freedom in our ability to see the worth of coming together. It has been a while since I have had the opportunity to witness a child play. There have not been a lot of children in my life since I left Calgary. And now, even more so with the pandemic limiting our connections. But this state of enchantment, this state of liminal sacredness that I speak of is something that I regularly witness when I see children play. When a child has the ability to play without pressure or without restriction, they become riveted by their own imagination. What if we could slip into that enchantment the next time we come to a fork in the road? What if we could use our imagination for all the possibilities of good rather than getting pinned under the weight of questions about what if? One of my favorite modern day philosophers, Jason Silva, speaks about this internal battle between following the norm and conforming versus living childhood dreams, living a life of authenticity. He speaks of the idea that we celebrate the rhapsody, the poetry and anguish of lines, such as the quote by Friedrich Nietzsche, those who were seen dancing were thought to be insane by those who could not hear the music. Or perhaps Jack Kerouac's quote, the only people for me are the mad ones, the ones who are mad to live, mad to talk, mad to be saved, desirous of everything at the same, at the same time. The ones who never yawn or say a commonplace thing, but burn, burn, burn like fabulous yellow Roman candles exploding like spiders across the stars. We idolize these quotes. We create magnets and stick them on our fridge or pin them beside our computer screens. And yet we live in a world in which we are constantly being told to settle, to let go of childish dreams, to deaden our desires. We want to live a life in which we can be transformed. We want to live a life where we can become enlightened. And yet we are too scared to step out of our ruts. So what permissions do you need to play with the structures of your life? What permissions do you need to step out of the ruts off of the path or break open the stone that you have etched your life into and play with possibility to become the master of your fate or the captain of your soul, as Silva puts it. What permissions do you need? I give it to you. Someone once told me that the prefix reverend holds a lot of power. So if you need me to, I will sign your permission slip. As we move ever closer towards the summer and the lifting of our pandemic restrictions, I am finding myself more and more often wanting to play with new possibilities. This pandemic knocked us off the road, knocked us out of our rut, and now we have the opportunity to redefine what it means to be a faith community. Our centering words spoke about about the myth of Scylla and Charybdis from the Greek mythology. An ancient day version of the phrase caught between a rock and a hard place. Scylla is a sea monster and Charybdis is a deadly whirlpool that would swallow ships. Both can be found in the Strait of Messina, a very narrow channel 
that ships needed to pass in order to enter the Mediterranean Sea from Italy. A rock, or perhaps a deadly whirlpool, and a hard place, a deadly sea monster. The youth from our centering words danced and played their way through the Strait of Messina. They jeered and cheered each other on as everyone had to pass between the rock and a hard place, between the rattlesnakes and the sand spurs. So perhaps the next time that you come up to a fork in the road, or the next time you are asking yourself if you should change directions, Perhaps you can remember to play. Seek the opportunities to allow yourself to create, play and imagine your own cosmos. Allow yourself the opportunity to become wrapped with your own imagination and simply play. Thank you for listening. <laughs>